sound yet? There we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday evening service. Take your hand below the stand. We may turn to number 461. Number 461. Stepping in the light. Let's sing the first, second, last stanzas. One, two, and four. 461. 461. Here we go. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. Trying to follow our Savior and King. Shaping our lives by his blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the line, stepping in the line. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Led in the path of light on the second pressing more closely to him who is leading when we are tempted to turn from the way trusting the arm that is strong to defend us happy how happy our praise as each day how beautiful to walk in the steps of the savior stepping in the light Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in the paths of light. On the last now, trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upwards to upward will follow our guide. When we shall see him, the king in his beauty, happy, how happy, our place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Amen. Good evening. Hopefully you had a good first half of the week and a beautiful day today. Hopefully you made it outside and uh, it was just a gorgeous day. But I'm glad that you're here this evening. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us day in and day out. Father, especially today uh, with the beautiful weather and just the chance to be able to, um, to go outside and enjoy your creation. Uh, thank you for how you've blessed us in other areas of life. And Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together here tonight. We ask that you bless the service. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I went on a walk with my wife. I think around lunchtime we sometimes are able to coordinate schedules and walk the dog about the same time. And there was this big pile of ice outside the gym today in the shade. It was just in the shade there for a while. But it was kind of funny because it was 50 plus degrees outside and there's ice sitting on the playground on the parking lot and so uh, I'm thinking that's probably going to go by the wayside and won't be here much longer and I'm okay with that aren't you I'm ready for this ice thing and winter and snow to be on for a little while and we can look forward to it in 10 months or so I guess uh, just one announcement tonight we do have a college and career minute to win it on Saturday that's the fifth and that'll be at 12 o'clock here at the fellowship hall you're welcome to invite friends or maybe uh, if you're not in college or starting out your career, uh, you know a neighbor or someone, that's a good opportunity for other people to invite uh, individuals as well. But see Brother John and Miss Tammy if you have any questions. Again, that's 12 o'clock here in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we do have a, a message tonight. We are gonna, I am going to preach from 2 Timothy tonight. But I'm going to be a little bit brief, uh, more brief than what I typically am on a Wednesday night. I want to talk about missions with you for just a moment. So I'm going to give you an update on some of the finances that we're doing with that. And uh, I won't end it incredibly early, maybe five or seven minutes early, just to give us a time to rehearse some of that. Uh, but I wanted to give you a heads up on that one, that we're going to do that shift in the evening service tonight. And then I think Brother John's reading our missions letter tonight. And we'll take prayer requests after that. But right now, we're not there yet. Go ahead and grab a hymnal. And Brother Tim's going to come back and lead us in a hymn. Thank you, Pastor. Remain seated, number 457, 457, 457. Let's sing the first, second, and last stanzas of More About Jesus. 457, verses 1, 2, and 4. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness seem, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness seem, 
more of his love who died for me. On the second, more about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. On the last now, more about Jesus on his throne, Riches and glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his more of his love who died for me. Remain seated just right across the page, number 456. Number 456, let's sing the first, second, and last verses here. One, two, and four also of I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. On the second, I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, me now, my Savior, I come to thee. On the last, I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed Son. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Everybody had a good first half of the week, yeah, lots of energy. Or coffee, either one's fine. We'll take either one of those. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, I don't know, maybe we have a couple weeks here before the grass starts growing. We have to do lawn maintenance, right? Uh, a little bit of time before that starts happening. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully had a good week. And uh, for Second Timothy chapter 4 is where we're going to be at tonight. I already mentioned to you that uh, I want to talk a little bit about missions. We've been talking about uh, salvation over the last few weeks. And so I want to bring our minds back to missions for just a moment because it's been some time since we focused on that specifically. Uh, let me ask you this, though. As you look at the Bible and you consider all the people in the Bible, as far as an example of a model Christian, who is your first person that you look to? Daniel? Paul? Anybody else? Joseph? All right, so this is a little bit of a trick question. There's only one right answer to this one. It's always Jesus Christ, okay? 
Now you're, you say, I know that one, I know that one. Uh, but besides that, and that's good, that's the second question I was going to ask. I just wanted you to make sure that Jesus Christ is always the right answer on that one. So number two, I would say Paul for me, Daniel, Joseph, a couple of other ones. Anybody else? Daniel, Joseph, Paul, Abraham, Abraham would be a good one. Ladies, those are all men, and I understand as a guy, I have a tendency to think as a guy, uh, when I'm preaching, any ladies stand out to you uh, that just mean a lot? Esther? Esther? Okay. Hannah? All right. Anybody else? Ruth? All right. Josh, you have your hand up? Moses? That's a good guy. And so a lot of people, uh, we look in the Bible and we say, you know, there, there's some people that we can really admire, and that's good. We need people to be able to aspire to be like, and if we're going to aspire to be like one, then Jesus Christ is our best example. But he gives us a lot of second choices, doesn't he? And some thirds. I like Paul because of all the things that God does through the Apostle Paul, and all the times I see the Apostle Paul do the right thing in a hard situation, and all the times I see God do things on behalf of the Apostle Paul because Paul's doing the right things in the right situations. And uh, it's just an interesting testimony. And so a uh, favorite scene in the Apostle Paul's life. Let's do that for just a second. We're getting somewhere. Favorite scene. Anybody? Uh, yes, Brother Keith. Okay, all right, for the saving of the ship, for the, the people in the ship, and uh, definitely. Anybody else? Brother Don? Amen. That's a good one. All right, anybody else? Brother Gary? The road to Damascus? That's a good one, yeah. Yep, when his life was in danger on the road to Jerusalem, his disciples said, don't go. He said, I'm going anyhow. Anybody else? I'm going to bring it down to a couple here. So I think one of the interesting ones, though I would agree with the ones that you've mentioned, is I think it's pretty interesting when he's bit by the snake, he dusts it off in the fire and then goes about his business, and everybody's like, this guy did something wrong, and then he, he makes it, and there's no problem. I think that's absolutely fascinating. I think the other times in the Apostle Paul's life that are pretty interesting to me uh, would be those that he was tr treated horribly and he kept doing what he knew he was supposed to do. Like uh, when he was drug out of the city and left for dead and then he gets back up and starts preaching again. Uh, that's just the type of guy the Apostle Paul was. And one of the reasons why I think I look at the Apostle Paul and think, okay, that's a pretty amazing guy, is because though I know he's not superhuman, he did all the things that I would hope I would do in those situations, and all the things happened to him that I would hope happened to me in those situations. Because sometimes you look at it and say, you know what, if I was bit by a venomous snake, I would die. But that didn't happen to the Apostle Paul. Or if I was on a shipwreck, this would have happened to me or something like that. And so there's just a lot neat about the Apostle Paul's life. And sometimes as a result of that, we elevate him up on a pedestal, which to some degree that's good. He served a, a particular purpose for a particular moment in time and God used him in an amazing way. He served God and set himself aside in an amazing way. And so I don't know that he, there is his equal in history. But 2 Timothy chapter 4 gives us a little bit more of a normal view of the Apostle Paul. If you'll go ahead and stand, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Our text tonight is verses 9 through 18, and so this will help us identify a little bit of where we're at. The Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And then it goes on from there. Let's open in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for the example that Jesus Christ gives us. And we also thank you for all the other examples that you give us in, in Scripture. Father, I ask that you be with us tonight. 
I pray that you give me the grace to preach and that I be an encouragement to your people tonight. In your name we pray, amen. So this is a pastoral epistle. Paul writes this to Timothy, uh, one of his um, pupils, if you will, a, a gentleman that's active in the ministry and has a wonderful testimony. He and Titus both do. This particular pastoral epistle is written during Paul's second Roman imprisonment towards the end of his life. And you can kind of get that tone as we read Romans chapter, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, you kind of get that impression as he's saying in verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. And so likely it's just a few years before Paul passes away that he pens this letter to Timothy. And uh, he shares some things that would be more towards the, uh, make us think of the end of life. Uh, but as we get to verse 9 and following, he shifts gears a little bit from exhorting Timothy, and he asks for a few things. And I think we have before us in verses 9 to 18, perhaps one of the best examples of Paul's humanity. Uh, we know that he did some, God did some amazing things through him, but verses 9 through 18 let me know that Paul was just a normal guy, and just a normal person like you and me. Notice some of the things that he mentions as he's uh, summarizing ministry. And this is also sharing information with Timothy. He shares uh, some information about people and what he's going through individually. And the reason I'm bringing this to you tonight is because sometimes it's helpful to, to know what people are going through. Sometimes we elevate the Apostle Paul up on a pedestal because God did some pretty amazing things through him. And this passage kind of brings him down and lets us see a little bit of hu his humanity. The parallel, I want to mention this to you tonight, is that sometimes we lift missionaries up on a pedal stool uh, because of their sacrifice, because of the unique places that they are in life, uh, because of the neat things that they're doing for God. And we need to remember to bring them down on a normal personal level and remember that they go through normal people things too. And so let's look at the Apostle Paul tonight. And notice what he mentions. He says in verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He lists a few people here, about four people he mentions in verse 10 and also in verse 12. And it's building off of verse 9. Do thy diligence, Timothy, to come shortly unto me. Demas hath forsaken me. And notice what it says, having loved this present world. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Demas. The name Demas only shows up two times in Scripture, but let me read those two passages. If you want to jot down the references, you're welcome to, uh, but for sake of time, we won't take the time to turn there. Colossians 4.14 says, Luke, the beloved physician, or physician in Demas, greet you. And so he's there in verse 14 of Colossians chapter 4 with Luke. He's also mentioned in Philemon 1, 23 and 24, where the Bible says, There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. And so from Scripture, we can learn that at the very least, though we don't know specifics, that he's mentioned in there with other people who had done Paul a great service, and he's, he's labeled as a fellow laborer of the Apostle Paul. And isn't that interesting that for whatever capacity, we don't know how long that Demas would have been with Paul, but based on the other references in Scripture, it seems that at least for some season, Demas was there laboring with Paul, but yet we find in 2 Timothy chapter 4, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Yeah, he shifted gears, and instead of looking to eternity, he started serving um, in some capacity to this present world, whether he wanted ease of life, whether he wanted finances, Whatever, all we have is that he had loved this present world. And I think just for a moment, what that might, must have done if I were in the Apostle Paul's shoes to know that in my life I had suffered, that I had suffered great loss, that I was willing to go through a lot. The Apostle Paul, again, we've mentioned some of those tonight, just some of the travesties that he went through in his life to have a fellow laborer desert him to go and to follow the cares of this present world. I wonder what that must have been like, to know that there was a fellow laborer once that was there that was an asset to the ministry that God had called him to that had now forsaken him and had loved his present world. It goes on, and it's a little bit melancholy, the list here, but they're not all negative, and it says uh, that he had loved his present world and has departed into Thessalonica, Crescus to Galatia, uh, Titus to Dalmatia. It says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. 
And then we skip down to verse 12, Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus. And so those are the names that we have, and not all of them would be negative. Demas was one that we could single out as negative, uh, but we know as, as far as uh, some of them go, Titus is one that would be, we would assume is positive. And then the name that we have in verse 12, Tychicus, we find again in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, where the Bible says, but that ye also may know of my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and, a fa and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. And so just because these individuals aren't with Paul doesn't mean that they're all gone away for bad reasons or negative reasons, but Demas at least is specifically mentioned. But the fact is, all these people aren't with the Apostle Paul. He again is under Roman care and in prison in some capacity and finds himself in, some, in one way or another without the company of friends that he's come to know and serve with through his life. As a matter of fact, he says specifically in verse 11, only Luke is with me. And I'm thinking as apparently based on the verses that we've already read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he knew the end was coming. At least it would, soon, it would seem that way. Uh, that all these people are either busy doing other parts of ministry or have defected from ministry. And then here the Apostle Paul is in prison. And he says in verse 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. I, I find it interesting. We don't know specifically why. We could have some conjecture. Perhaps it was that Paul still had some things in ministry he needed to accomplish but couldn't in prison. I think that's a valid option. But I think also it seems that the Apostle Paul here is, is lacking for company. And maybe it's a combination of the two. I couldn't say that it's definitely the lacking for company, but that at least fits the tone of the passage. And so use your own discernment there. But is it interesting that he's asking for Timothy to come? Luke only is with me. He does single out and say, Luke only is with me. Everybody else is gone. So I would encourage you to think about that as it relates to our missionaries. They do great things whenever they come to our church to raise support or to share their ministry. They have their best face on because they're passionate about what they do. And sometimes we forget that it's lonely and that it's hard. And so this is just a reminder tonight. It's not all bad. It's not all horrible. But I want to bring up some things in just a little bit that uh, gives you an opportunity to be able to, to pray about some things and be an encouragement. So remember, sometimes missionaries are by themselves. Sometimes ministers and, for, and other places can't get around. He was locked in prison. Um, the Apostle Paul was. And he valued people to be there. He valued those uh, that could be here, be there with him. If you look also in verse 11, it says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. And so he's asking that Timothy would be there. And the Bible tells us a couple of things about Timothy. Um, second uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 19 through 21 would be a good reference if you want to look up some of the things that Paul said about Timothy. But Mark was there, and Mark has an interesting testimony. Mark was the one that deserted Paul on a missionary journey. Barnabas took him under wing and uh, brought him along in ministry. And Paul says of Mark specifically in verse uh, 2 Timothy 4.11, Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable, for me, uh, profitable to me for the ministry. And so Mark was one that had a, a special point in Paul's life, and he was saying, bring him with you, bring him with you. We find then people mentioned, but after that, we find that Paul is asking for a few things. In verse 13, the Bible says, The cloak that I left uh, at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. Now, it's interesting that a man who seems to be closing in on the end of life, at least it would uh, seem he again, he has the idea of that or knows that it's likely coming, is asking for a couple of basic necessities. A cloak, simply defined as an outer garment, but look in verse 21. What does the Bible say about what Paul is about to face? It says in verse 21, Do thy diligence to come before winter. And so it's interesting, we find Paul then in prison, he can't get out. He's asking for a cloak, an outer garment, so to keep warm because he doesn't have it. This remind, reminds me of some basic necessities that you and I sometimes take for granted that we have that sometimes people don't have access to. And so he asks specifically again for an outer garment. He asks for books in verse 12. Uh, those weren't bound books like we have or your Bible or the hymnal in front of you. It would have been a scroll. That would be uh, the, the definition of a book in the Bible. But he asks for books. And again, we don't know what books. But I can tell you as a minister what I value about books. 
Uh, I like reading them as it relates to explaining passages. And so maybe it was that Paul was asking for copies of the Old Testament. Maybe it was that he was writing or asking about other epistles that had been written to churches. Who knows, but he was looking for books. He was also asking for them to bring parchments. And then we, again, we don't know much more about parchments than we would about the books that he asks for, but likely these would be less official. Uh, maybe notes that the apostle had written down or notes that had been given to him. Whatever the case may be, he asked for three pretty basic things. Bring my cloak, bring the books, especially bring the parchments. Now again, I can't say what parchments are. Um, you, you can read and you can get some conjecture, but we have only what is here and then what historically would be used as parchments. But let's assume just for argument's sake or illustration's sake tonight that they're notes, okay? Y'all have blessed our family with notes recently, and I can't tell you how helpful that is and how much of an encouragement that is to, to hear how God has used us in your life or to you hear how um, we've been a blessing to you. Um, I don't mean that in a prideful sense. I'm not looking for an ego build there. I hope you understand that one. Uh, but if we're here to serve, then it's helpful to know that God has used us in your life to be a, a blessing to you. Now, I don't know that that's what, what um, Paul had mentioned, and I can't say that authoritatively. All I'm saying is if it's notes, while well, you've given me notes recently, and so let's apply that to missionaries. You know what helps sometimes? People knowing that are acknowledging, hey, you're serving us. You're doing something for us. You're a blessing to us. You're, you're doing these things on our behalf. Your sacrifice is helpful. Your sacrifice is a blessing. And so Paul asked for a cloak. It kind of makes us wonder if there are missionaries in our world that, that could just use some basic necessities uh, that we sometimes forget we have um, at plenty. So I can go to Walmart and get a cloak. That's not a problem. But not everybody has that luxury. Paul didn't have that luxury. He wanted books. Sometimes missionaries are going around, uh, evangelists are going around and just collecting books. I have a friend that was collecting Bibles a few years ago, and he wanted, didn't want just any Bible. He wanted the Bibles that have notes in them, like a Schofield Study Bible or something along those lines. He said, I can take a Bible, and I can put Bibles in the hands of missionaries or evangelists in foreign field, but they don't have access to literature to read. And so if you have a good study Bible, that you're willing to give me, I'll take that good study Bible that has good notes, and then that pastor who doesn't have a library on foreign soil can look at the notes in the Bible, and that's a big help to him. I can look that up on the internet. I can, I can look, and I have books all in my office. Some of my Bibles, I, I don't know that I have any notes in my Bibles just because of the Bibles that I, I use are usually for preaching. I usually don't preach from Schofield Study Bible notes. <laughs> Isn't that a comfort for you to know? But... <laughs> But that's a big asset. Those are things that we have uh, readily at our, our disposal. Uh, so I'm going to stop there tonight. I simply want to remind you that Paul, of all the things that he had done, all the things that God had done through him, all the heartaches he'd overcome, all the difficulties he's overcome, all the people that he reached, all the great lands that he traveled, all the foreign soil that he set foot on, all the hearts that he touched, all the people that he brought into the kingdom of heaven, or God brought into the kingdom of heaven through him, we find in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in these few verses, a man who's preparing to end ministry that's in prison, and he says, hey, I value companionship, I value people here. Luke only is with me. Bring Mark, Timothy, come on. I would like my cloak, I would like my books, and especially the parchments. Remember those. Those are some pretty basic things, aren't they? I look at Paul, and I think of the amazing things that he's done, and I look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I remember that God works just through normal humans for those who set themselves aside for his work. And the missionaries that we support are no different. We look on, um, I'll, I'll mention these just briefly. If you look in verses 14 to 18, we find a warning. Alexander the cop coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. We don't know what that is specifically. We can guess based on the context. But the coppersmith, Alexander the coppersmith, had done him great harm in ministry some way, in some form or fashion. That's a blow to a minister. That's a blow to a missionary. That's an, a blow to an evangelist when someone's actively doing harm to the ministry that you're giving your life towards. That is, a, I don't know, an emotional stab at the very, mo at the very least. That would deprive Paul of energy. That would uh, uh, deprive Paul of, of forward momentum. And that's the same thing missionaries and ministers face in our world today. And so we need to pray for our missionaries. It goes on and it mentions Paul in verse 16. For at my first answer, no man stood with me, 
Paul is recounting at some point in his life where he stood before and he had to give a defense or an answer for his name. And he says, I stood there alone. There was no one in a court setting, if you will, maybe a Roman court setting that would stand up and give testimony to who I was as an individual or what I was doing. I had to stand there by myself. Have you ever had to stand somewhere by yourself before and just articulate and come to your own defense? That was the Apostle Paul. He said, no one stood with me. Now, we have his testimony that, that he just plugged away, and that's great. That's what we would hope that he would have to do. But some of our missionaries are in the same boat, uh, that they're standing by themselves. And you say, well, what can we do in that regard? I can't be there with the missionaries. No, you can't. But it goes back to those notes, those, pat, those parchments, where we can be an encouragement to people. And even if they don't know we're praying for them, God answers prayer, doesn't he? We might not know the specific needs, but we know right now that there are people in Ukraine that are going through a lot of difficulties. We know that there are people across our world that are going through a lot of difficulties. And Paul, I would guess, had people praying for him in verses 4 through 18. If, I, if he didn't, he sure could have used them at that point when he was standing by himself. But he did mention in those passages, I'll let you read it, that the Lord delivered him, the Lord was with him, the Lord gave him strength. And that's what prayer does. So the reminder tonight from Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 4, is that we have a tendency to lift missionaries up and put them on pedestals. When we see them, they typically have smiling faces. They're, they're dressed nice. They're here with us. We're enjoying a, a good setting. And when we go home to our, our houses or the comfort of our, our own town, they're getting up and they're moving to the next town. And they're going to the next church or they're getting ready for the mission field. And I think we need to remember that. That life isn't for a missionary just a bunch of, uh, of roses. It's not just all easy, though I trust there are blessings galore. Paul had blessings galore, but he was still just a man that had needs. Our missionaries are people that have needs, and it does us well to bring them before the Lord in prayer. For tonight, I'm going to dismiss us in prayer. We'll forego the, the song in conclusion. And so I'm going to pray uh, just that God would work in our missions program, that God would be with our missionaries. I would encourage you to do the same. If there's something specific the Lord's laid on your heart, please deal with that. This, this would be the invitation. So I'll pause just for a couple of minutes to give you an opportunity, if you need to pray a little bit longer than I do, to go ahead and do that. But we'll take a moment here to pray for our missionaries as we conclude this preaching portion of our service. Heavenly Father, you've blessed our church greatly. Uh, we can look down the walls of the hall as we leave tonight or as we come in and see the missionaries that you've given us an opportunity to support. As you've called them, Father, you've equipped us to be able to help send. And we can't thank you enough for that. Uh, Father, to give us the opportunity to, to steward different resources uh, to affect the gospel going out and to affect people being discipled. Father, as a church, that's a privilege. And we want to stop and say thank you. We want to remember those who are on the field or going through difficult times or in transition or um, just facing obstacles in ministry. Uh, Father, we read some tonight that the Apostle Paul went through, and we can't help but think there are some unique ones that our missionaries are going through. So as we conclude our service tonight, Father, we ask that you would be with them during their times of need. And, Father, that you would help us know how to steward the resources that you've given us. Father, I pray that you'd help bring those missionaries to mind, that we would know how to pray for them throughout the week, um, that we would be attentive when we read mission letters, and that we would be attentive to the direction of your Holy Spirit as we consider what you'd have us to do with the missions program. Father, thank you for those who are here tonight. Thank you for putting it in their hearts to give to the missions program of our church, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to give testimony to the great things that you do. In your name we pray.